Well, open your Bibles to Mark chapter 4, the fourth chapter of the book of Mark. We took the summer off to look at a special study on bibliology and the power and authority and efficacy of God's Word, and now we've come back to rejoin our study of the Gospel of Mark. You'll remember that Mark is unique among the four Gospels. They all do similar things. They all do unique things, all four Gospels. Mark is intending for us to see what Jesus did, know what Jesus said, observe who Jesus was, and make the evaluation that he is ultimately worth following in every dimension of our lives. Let's kind of frame that up again. Mark wants us to see what Jesus did, what Jesus said, and who Jesus was, his character, his his essence, his personality, his personhood. And based on those observations to conclude that he is worth our following. He's worth every part of our life. We've looked in the first three chapters just as Mark sets up this, this man who came out of Nazareth. And people had no readiness for who he was, what he would say, and what he would do. Healing diseases, casting out demons, teaching with authority. But there's a distinctive change that happens in Mark 4. And this is a theological high point. We're going to spend a few weeks in Mark chapter 4, specifically on this parable. And the reason is Jesus intends for this to be a point of reference, a parable, a, a teaching both for the believers to be encouraged in their understanding of their faith and how people respond to their evangelism. And it's also an open appeal for anyone who has ears, spiritual ears, to develop spiritual hearing. The title is basically looking at the anatomy of hearing. How can you hear spiritually? What we're gonna do, just a little orientation, we're gonna look at at what Mark does here. Mark, Mark has another, what we call Markin sandwich. Remember where he starts something, does something else, and then comes back to the first thing he starts? Well, he does that here. We're only gonna look at the first one and a half parts. What he does is he tells a parable. He tells a story. Then he gives insight about why he tells the parable. Then he explains the parable. We're gonna look at those first one and a half parts today in the coming few weeks. I was gonna do it in a week or two, but... I'm going to blame Mike Walgy, who said, take your time, so it may be another four weeks as we look at each of these soils. This is the parable of the soils. Follow along as I read the first 12 verses. Jesus began to teach again by the sea. And such a very large crowd gathered to him that, that he got into a boat in the lake. And he sat down. And the whole crowd was by the sea on the land. And he was teaching them in many things in parables and was saying to them in his teaching, listen to this, behold, the sower went out to sow. And as he was sowing, some seed fell beside the road and the birds came and ate it up. Other seed fell on the rocky ground where it did not have much soil and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of soil. And after the sun had risen, it was scorched. And because it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns and the thorns came up and, and choked it out and it yielded no crop. Other seeds fell into the good soil. And as they grew up and increased, they yielded a crop and produced 30, 60, and 100 fold. And he was saying, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. As soon as he was alone, his followers, along with the 12, began asking him about the parables. And he was saying to them, to you, 
it has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God. But those who are outside get everything in parables so that while seeing, they may not see and not perceive. And while hearing, they may hear and not understand. And otherwise, they might return and be forgiven. If you've been around the Bible for any amount of time, you have heard of the parables. They are a beloved part of the New Testament. There are many parables in the Old Testament, but Jesus' teaching in particular is riddled with, well, I guess pun intended, riddled, riddled with parables. What is a parable? A parable is, is an interesting teaching device. The word comes from two Greek words, Para, which means beside, coming alongside, and balo, which means to throw. So to throw alongside, literally. It means that two things are compared because they are alike in some ways. You lay one thing against the other and you see the similarities. One, in other words, illustrates the other. So a parable is a story or a metaphor that points to something beyond the story. It's an illustration of a greater spiritual truth. Parables of Jesus, as I said, are one of the most recognizable parts of the Bible, specifically of the New Testament. And for good reason, when you analyze the volume of the parables in the Gospels, it's clear that this kind of teaching was integral to Jesus' instruction when he walked on this planet. So I got my concordance out and I did a little, little research. And I want to list just for a moment, just humor me for a moment, Jesus' parables. This doesn't count the ones that are listed in multiple gospels. These are his parables. The parable of the soils. Let's start with Mark. In Mark, you'll find the parable of the soils in Mark 4. The parable of the seed growing secretly. The parable of the mustard seed. The parable of the vine growers, the tenants. The parable of the budding fig tree. The parable of the faithful servant. Go to Matthew and you find other parables not found in Mark. The parable of the wheat and the tares, the parable of the leaven, the parable of hidden treasure, another of the hidden pearl, of the pearl of great price, the parable of the, the dragnet, the net that's cast out, the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the unmerciful servant, the parable of the laborers in the vineyard, the parable of the two sons, the parable of the wedding feast and the banquet, the parable of the ten virgins, the parable of the talents. Go to Luke and you find other ones not found in Matthew or Mark. The parable of the two debtors, the parable of the good Samaritan, the parable of the parable of the rich fool, the parable of the lost coin, the parable of the prodigal son, the parable of the unjust steward. And then the 24th parable is the parable of the rich man and the beggar named Lazarus, which is much debate over whether that's a parable or not. But just for argument's sake, that's 24 different parables, multiple repetitions within the gospel accounts of these parables. Jesus loved to teach in parables, but he also did so for a specific purpose. And that purpose has been so muddied and so riddled and so befuddled that most actually look at parables as this soft, sweet, charming illustration, perfect for flannel boards and teaching the little children. But to understand parables from that angle, is to miss the main point that Jesus intends for us to see, not only in the explanation of the parables, but in why he teaches them parables in the first place. Now, the Gospel of Mark, in general, has some unique features from the other synoptics, from Matthew and from Luke. And the most glaring difference is the amount of space that Mark devotes, or I should say the limited amount of space that Mark devotes to Jesus' teaching. Mark tells us that he did a lot of things. He performed a lot of things. How he was treated, how he was perceived. He's telling us to consider not only what Jesus taught, but the accent on what he did and who he was. There are only two extended sections that record Jesus' teaching in Mark. There are some scattered other places. But basically here in chapter four is a collection of parables. And in chapter 13, which is a discourse on end times. Outside of that, it's mostly just showing what Jesus did and how people responded and how he responded to their response. 
So here's our plan for studying this first parable in chapter four. It's the parable of the soils. Today we're going to look at parables in general, kind of get our orientation about what the parables are. Understand the the specifics of this particular parable. Then we're going to look at parables briefly in general through the lens of this one because Jesus gives us an insight into why he gave parables. And then we're going to follow Jesus' pattern of telling a story. We're going to make some observations. We're going to go home for a week. We're going to come back next week and start looking at what it means because that's exactly how it flows in the book of Mark. By the way, that's exactly in Matthew 13 what Matthew records too. He tells a story, people scratch their heads. Later, the disciples come to him privately and say, what did that mean? And he explains it to them. He told told the story, then cycled back to explain it. In the coming weeks, we're going to look at the details of each of these soils, which, as I've looked at this for weeks, has given me both encouragement and terror that perhaps all four soils could be represented here on a Sunday morning at Mission Road Bible Church. I think you're going to find this study insightful for your own heart as well as understanding the responses to your evangelism. And as I said, this is just gonna be getting our our compass square. This is gonna be an orientation point to begin diving into it next week. So as an outline to follow along, I wanna observe with you four keys for unlocking the meaning of Jesus' parables. Four keys for unlocking the meaning of Jesus' parables. We talk about keys and unlocking as a normal part of our our, uh, kind of description and discussion and in the English language, but I really mean these are keys that unlock meaning. And without these keys, you could be easily lost and misinterpret and then misapply these stories. The first key is this, to understand this. Parables are word pictures that illustrate. They are word pictures that illustrate. It's not new to hear that Jesus is was a master teacher. So much can be learned from both what he taught, but much can be learned from how he taught. It's been said by so many that the best teachers are masters at providing illustrations. Just as a little aside, as a preacher, I can't tell you how true this really is. Sometimes unintentionally, I could list countless occasions on which I had preached, I hope, with relative clarity, a text only to be reminded either that day or in subsequent days or weeks, not of the meaning of that text, but of the illustration I gave. Oh, I remember when you talked about that time that you took your son. I remember when your dog, and I rem- <sighs> that wasn't the point of the text. What that tells me is that all of our hearts are attuned to stories and to illustrations. When you, when you see an illustration, that's kind of like a building of meaning and it has a window in it and you look through that window to see into what it means. When I mark my notes, this goes back 30 years. Still to this day, when I mark my notes and I have an illustration, I put a square with a cross in it that looks like a window. And that tells me, here comes an illustration. There are ways to see into what you're trying to say. It's a way of, painting a word picture that stacks on top of the words. So we're not surprised to see Jesus displaying great abilities in the art of illustrating. But he didn't have, you know, this book, 5,000 sermon illustrations that he referenced. More often than not, he grabbed an illustration that most likely was in front of their eyes, that they had seen often, parable, a story with which they're very familiar. For this study, we're going to think about parables in general through this, this parable of the soils. And I think you're going to find that Jesus does things with parables that might surprise you. He begins in verse 1, 
with his teaching context. He began to teach again by the sea. Such a very large crowd gathered to him that he got into a boat and in the lake and the sea and sat down. The whole crowd was by the sea in the land. I'll show you a picture of this uh, situation where Jesus was. It was called the Cove of Parables, the north shore of Galilee. It's been said by auditor, uh, um, auditory engineers that this might be one of the most perfect places to teach in a natural setting in all the world. It was a cove that came around with a perfect bold amphitheater that was, that was sloping up to a ridge. Jesus pulled people there by going to the sea and then he gets in a boat, he moves from the boat, in the boat out into the lake and into the, area, into the area right in the middle of this bowl and he sits down. That's significant when it says he sits down. He wasn't tired, he wasn't just trying to keep balance in the boat. He sat down because that was the place of a Jewish rabbi's authority. And he sits down in this situation where scholars have identified would have been a perfect place to speak without electrical amplification. Sitting in the boat on the lake would have provided an excellent situation. It would be a, what we call a reverse sounding board. If you'll go into the old Puritan churches, they had a sounding board, which is a, a flat board right above the preacher so that when he preached, the voice would go up to the sounding board, bounce off that, and it would be like natural amplification. This is just the opposite. Jesus' sounding board was the water, was the lake. He spoke, it bounced off the water and went into this perfect cove where the people would have sat to listen to him speak. Verse two. And he was teaching them many things in parables. Stop right there. This is not the only parable that Jesus spoke in this cove of parables. He had a launching point of sermons that he probably told several stories. Matthew 13, you have a, a collection of them. We'll see a few less here in Mark chapter 4. He told these stories, and more than likely, the, the people were saying, oh, that's a neat story. That's great. Only a few were going to find out came back and said, what, what did you mean by that? So he dives into this parable. The New American Standard says, listen to this, which is not a bad translation. The Greek literally says, listen up. Stop. Listen. Look at me. Focus. Behold. And we've said over and over, when you see the word behold in the Bible, it's almost like we would say, guess what? Behold. The sower went out to sow. It is likely, we can't know, that on that very hill could have been a sower sowing seeds. It is not beyond the realm of any imagination that all of these people walked past fields that were experiencing sowing. This would have been the springtime, probably uh, when Jesus gathers these people in this cove of parables. And that was a time that people were planting seeds for the harvest. He tells us some details. As he was sowing, some seed fell beside the road. Stop right there. Now, in order to understand this, you have to erase your idea of fields in Missouri and Kansas. I love driving through western Kansas. I know that may sound a little odd to some of you, but it's beautiful for a while. Um, and then you get into eastern Colorado, and then it's, anyway, it's really flat. You go by field after field with these big sprinkler systems and combines and tractors and fences. That's not what this was like. This was, if you had a field that was flat, you were extremely fortunate and probably very wealthy. Most of these fields were made out of self, uh, human-made terraces. There's not a lot of flat places in Israel. Uh, if you've ever gone on a tour in Israel, you will 
Just ask someone who has, and it's all up and all down, so that when Isaiah talks about the, the great day when the hills will be leveled and the valleys will come up, that would have been a really attractive um, thought to someone who walks everywhere up and down hills. Well, what they would do is they would take rock and build walls and, and on the hill would create terraces where they could plant things. Most of the agriculture was there. In between these terraces were little paths. That's what you have to think of when you hear the word road. These rock walls is what you should think of when you hear of rocks. So let's look at the details now. The sower went out to sow. That's someone who's planting seeds who scattered seeds. Now think of this, no tractors, no combines. They would have a satchel, a bag on a shoulder strap that was in on their, their side, on their left side if they're right-handed, on their right side if they're left-handed. And they would take and scatter the seed in an arch. Walk a little further, scatter the seed in an arch. They, they were very proficient at throwing seeds. So this sower, he goes out to scatter seeds, to sow. As he was throwing seeds and sowing, some of the seed fell by the path, by the road between the, the fields or even on the terrace, the way you would walk so that you wouldn't trample your harvest. No fences, just roads. By the way, we know this is roads without fences because of the law. We studied this when we looked at the, at the book of Ruth. Remember the law of gleaning where after the harvesters would come, then those who were poor could come behind and pick up what was left on the ground and they could glean. Some of the seed fell beside the path, beside the road. And guess what? The birds came and ate it up. This is not a tough illustration to understand if you've ever been anywhere to throw popcorn or seed or something where birds are gathered. You throw it out and they immediately come. Imagine this situation where he's scattering the seeds and it goes into some, some plowed ground and it's not as easy to pick off. But imagine these birds seeing this, this seed on, on flat, barren paths. That's the idea. Other seed fell on the rocky ground where it did not have much soil and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of soil. After the sun had risen, it was scorched because it had no root and withered away. This was likely the rocks that were the retaining walls around these terraces. As you know, if you have any pavers in your backyard, you constantly have to weed those pavers and you have to pull plants out of that. Typically, those don't come from the ground up. They come from soil being blown on, on these, uh, these areas, settling down in. And there's enough of soil where the seed germinates, dies, begins to grow, but it has no root, so it doesn't last long. Other seeds fell among the thorns, and the thorns came and choked it, and it yielded no crop. This was likely at the edges of the field where it hadn't been weeded. There were thistles and thorns. Sometimes there were thorns that were used as windbreaks, thorn bushes. And if you threw seed in there, it did, the seed didn't have a chance. It would begin to germinate, come up, find no sunlight because of the, the bushes of the thorns and would wither away. But, verse eight, other seeds fell into the good soil, this plowed, fertile ground in Israel. And as they grew up and increased, they yielded a crop. And they produced 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. Jesus' hearers would have been very familiar with this, this scene. They would have seen it, all along the terraces, that, that uh, photo I showed you uh, just a moment ago, you can see these terraces on that bowl. If you walk around, if you look, uh, drive around Israel today, you can still see these terraces. They would have seen this all the time. I just find it amazing how committed they were to growing crops with seeds scattered by hand. I've sometimes thrown grass seed and, um, because I was too cheap to go rent one of those little seed throwers. and It's a pain. And also, it, it, it has a great amount of skill to it. 
You know, when I scattered seed, there were piles of seed and then three seeds somewhere else. It just wasn't very easy to do. No tractors, no combines, all by hand. Now, next week, we're going to say, what does this mean? Jesus doesn't tell the crowd, listen, he doesn't tell the crowd initially what he means. I mean, just think about this for a moment. Put yourself on that hill. And I just tell you this story. A man goes out and he throws seed. Some seed lands on these three soils where it doesn't work out. And some seed lands on the good soil. Buy. What do we make of this? Now, this parable has been called by many the parable of the sower. If you'll notice, the sower doesn't play a big role in this parable. It's really a parable more about the soils and the seed. I prefer to call it the parable of the soil. Common sight for the hearers, no fences, no guardrails. They were just walking among these fields to get from one place to another. Now, as we begin to look at these details, let me just get, give an aside about parables. Be very careful. Let me beg you. Be very aware and very careful of over-interpreting and over-assigning meaning to every detail. I want to keep that in mind that every detail does not contain some deep and profound truth. Don't overbake these stories. Let me give you a, kind of a silly example. It would be something like this. If I said to you, um, you know, we're going to go down to um, the plaza and, and try to find some friends who we think might be coming today or tomorrow, and we think it's either the plaza and not downtown, but we're going to try to find them. And you said, well, that's like trying to find a needle in a haystack. And I would say, oh, I know what you mean. Let's first of all ask, what kind of hay is it? What gauge needle is it? How big is the hole at the top of the needle for the thread? How many people are looking for this needle? How many bales of hay are we talking about? Was the hay baled or had the hay been loosed and scattered? Was the needle placed inside a strand of hay or just tossed into the pile? How old was the person looking for this needle? Was the needle in a, had the needle been disinfected so that if you're reaching through the hay and you got poked, you wouldn't get infected? I mean, if you're telling, if you're saying it's like looking for a needle in a haystack and people are asking these questions, they're gonna go, you've got issues. It basically is just saying it's hard to find. That's it. Don't overbake the details in a parable. It's just a simple illustration to illustrate something so you have to find the something that it's illustrating and more times than not, Jesus tells you exactly what it's about. That leads us to number two. Again, we're high altitude this morning. Second key, parables identify insiders and outsiders. Parables identify insiders and outsiders. Verse 11, he was saying to them, now he's still got the crowd gathered. I'm sorry, the crowd has now dispersed and the disciples come to him. And he says, to you it's been given the mystery of the kingdom of God, but to those who are outside, they get everything in parables. Now, verse 11 is really insightful. He talks about insiders and outsiders. To you it has been given. Yes, this is about the sovereignty of God and salvation. Jesus is the one who granted the understanding to those who would understand. But also, he says, let him who has ears to hear, hear. There's a perfect balance of human responsibility and divine sovereignty. The disciples were theological insiders. But don't miss the point that the disciples didn't get it at first. Verse 10, as soon as he was alone, now the crowd is dispersed, his followers, the believers, along with the 12, began asking him about the parables. See that? That's significant. They didn't understand at first. It required Jesus' 
explanation. The disciples were theological insiders. They had been given ears to hear. We'll find out what that means in just a moment. They had been given eyes to see. But above all that, they had ears and eyes because they had, because they had hearts that believed. They had trusted that Jesus was who he said he was, and they believed the gospel. Which brings us to a third key for understanding the parables. Those outside get everything in parables at the end of verse 11. Number three, parables both conceal and reveal spiritual truth. This is the surprise for most people. Parables were given to reveal spiritual truth, but the the disciples were taught we can read that the parables were also given to hide and conceal spiritual truth. That may be a bit a surprise to some. Sometimes they can, parables can perplex and hide a spiritual truth on purpose. Now, why? Why would he do this? He's gonna let Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah tell us in a moment. Parables require interpretation. They require explanation from Jesus. And one of the points of Jesus' teaching in parables was to identify the serious believers who would follow up to understand what Jesus was teaching. I think there's a great principle here that those who hear spiritual truth and don't understand it have the gumption, have the desire to follow up to say, what does that mean? Adam and I have talked for years about this. I I was a youth pastor for many years and I loved it when you had students who would linger, students who would set up an appointment, students who would call to say, now you said this? Was that about me? Was that about, what, what does that mean? And as a pastor, I can tell you, a senior pastor, when someone follows up and says, I need help with this, Someone, someone, uh, uh, he may be here, so I haven't looked around to see. This is a good story. Someone texted me recently and said this. Rick, I hate to bother you, but I was just reading a passage, listen to the passage, and not sure what this means. <laughs> you hate to bother me with that? I would love to compare other texts I get to that one. That's a great text. That's a joyful text. And it's not just the pastor who can fill in the blanks. You can with each other, care group leaders and Sunday school teachers and elders following up. But Jesus is saying in verse 11, look, it was given to you to understand, but wasn't given to others to understand. Those who are outside get everything in parables. They they, they get the illustration, but they don't get the meaning. David Garland writes, Jesus' explanation conveys that parables are like a two-edged sword that reveals the mystery of the kingdom to the disciples who come to Jesus for understanding, but they deepen the spiritual blindness in others. Verse 12 is the critical verse that gives us the insight we need. He says, so that, and now he quotes Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel. While seeing, they may see and not perceive. While hearing, they may hear and not understand. Otherwise, or I wish, they might return and be forgiven. Listen, Jesus is not teaching something new. The idea of hiding things in parables from those who are not open to the truth of God goes all the way back to the Older Testament. Isaiah chapter six. Isaiah six, nine and following. He said, go and tell this people, Keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Remind, render the hearts of this people insensitive. Their ears dull, their eyes dim. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears. Understand with their hearts. Return and be healed. Isaiah asks the Lord, 
Then I said, Lord, how long? And he answered, until the cities are devastated and without, without inhabitation, houses are without people, and the land is utterly desolate. The Lord has removed men far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. Yet there will be a tenth portion in it, and it will be subject to burning like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when it's felled. The holy seed is its stump. What is he saying? Isaiah, this is the passage Jesus is, one of the passages Jesus is referencing. The Lord is telling Isaiah, you're gonna tell people who are gonna have an understanding of the, I was gonna say the English, the Hebrew that you're saying, they understand the sentences, but they don't understand what, what you mean. And that's a judgment. It's not like this is the first time God has ever communicated to these people, but they have stiff-armed his message. They've rejected and resisted his will. They've pursued their own sin and, and longed after idols rather than God. And he finally says, I'm not gonna stop teaching and preaching, but your ears and eyes to see and to hear what I'm saying are gonna dissolve. Jeremiah 5, 21. Now hear this, O foolish and senseless people, who have eyes but do not see, who have ears but do not hear. Ezekiel 12, verse two, son of man, you live in the midst of the rebellious house who have eyes to, but do not see, who have ears but do not hear, for they are a rebellious house. Jesus is referencing these passages that point to the fact that if you don't hear what God is communicating, if you won't hear what God is communicating, he will continue to allow you and even turn your ears and eyes off in disbelief. I think it's interesting. You might want to turn over and look at this. In Matthew chapter 13, in which Jesus tells this same parable, Matthew adds some details that are helpful to us. Verse 13, Matthew 13, verse 13. The Lord says, therefore, I speak to them in parables, talking to the disciples, because while seeing, they do not see, while hearing, they do not, do not hear, nor do they understand. By the way, understanding is the essence of not seeing and not hearing is, do you understand? In their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled, which says you will keep on hearing, but will not understand. You will keep on seeing, but will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull, with their ears, they scarcely hear. And when they've closed their eyes, otherwise they would see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understanding, understand with their heart in return. And I would heal them, but he says to the disciples, blessed are your eyes because they do see and your ears because they do hear. For truly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desire to see what you see, but they didn't get a chance to see it. Hear what you hear, and they didn't hear it. They didn't get the chance. When you stitch those two parallel accounts together, you can see what Jesus is saying. The Pharisees, scribes, Sadducees, the false teachers who are now mocking Jesus, turning their back on Jesus, rejecting what he would said, rejecting his authority. Because of their rejection and disbelief, God was now, in the words of Romans 1, turning them over to their disbelief. Oh, they had ears, they had eyes, but they couldn't understand these meanings. Sometimes, though, we saw this, I think, in our Bible reading, uh, Scripture reading last week. Sometime, two weeks ago, sometimes in Jesus, Luke chapter 20, will well, say things that are clear enough that the people, the Pharisees knew he was talking about them, but they didn't understand what to do in response. Bottom line is one of the features of the parables that many miss is Jesus spoke these stories not for flannel graphs, but for judgment. Just an aside for a moment. It's been a trend in recent decades to suggest that since Jesus taught in stories, so should preachers today. It's called narrative preaching. Eugene Lowry famously has written, a sermon is not a doctrinal lecture. 
It's an event in time, a narrative art form akin to a play or a novel in shape to a book. Hence, we are not engineering scientists. We are narrative artists by professional function. Does it not seem strange to you, he asks, that in our speech and homiletical training, we seldom consider the connection between our work and that of the playwright, the novelist, or the television writer? I propose that we begin by regarding the sermon as a homiletical plot, a narrative art form, a sacred story, end quote. If you've been in a liberal church, you understand it's basically creating thought and questions and stories and platitudes rather than being authoritative from this is what God's word says. Let's understand it and obey it. But they get that philosophy of preaching from the fact that Jesus taught in parables, not taking into the account that oftentimes Jesus taught in parables so people would not understand, not so that they would. Which leads us to number four, parables reveal those with spiritual hearing. We've said it in a number of ways. Look at verse three. He says, listen, listen up. I love what we're doing in the book of Proverbs. Be wise enough to know you're not wise enough. Verse nine, he was saying, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Here's the point of this parable and every parable. Do you have ears to hear? Which is a similar question to, will you have ears to hear? Can you hear and will you hear? I read this week this interesting account and I I couldn't help but share it with you. Rodney Cooper writes about this in this interesting situation account. He says this, a man consulted a doctor and told him that his wife was going deaf. I asked her, what are we having for dinner? And she doesn't answer. Bring her in and the doctor said, and I'll examine her. So the man brought his wife in. The doctor had her stand 50 feet away and he said to the man, go ahead and ask her what's for dinner. Hey, honey, he said, what's for dinner? Next, the doctor had the woman stand 40 feet away. Hey, honey, the man said, what's for dinner? After going through this routine several times, the doctor finally had her stand five feet away. Hey, honey, the man said, for the sixth time, what's for dinner? The wife looked at the doctor and then back at her husband. And for the sixth time, I've said spaghetti. The man thought the wife had the hearing problem. That wasn't the problem. He had the hearing problem. Now, as humorous as that may seem, the presumption of that is exactly what's going on in this text. These Pharisees, these scribes, these Sadducees thought they had the inside scoop on God. They thought Jesus was the one who didn't perceive and understand. It was them. Verse 13 marks an end to the parable. He said to them, do you not understand this parable How will you understand all the parables? Matthew records the same thing. You know what Jesus is saying about the parable of soils? This one is foundational. This is basic. If you get this one, the rest will open up. If you miss this one, you're gonna be in trouble trying to interpret other parables. If you can't get this one, how will you understand any parable? How can you see and how can you hear is another way of saying, do you understand? Will you understand? Jesus is saying, the meaning of the story would only be revealed to those who are willing to follow the meaning of the story. For everyone else, it's just a riddle without explanation. You ever, maybe there's some, some families done this, you, you have these travel games that you, you do and, it was four against one on these travel games. We used to do these, these riddle games where, you know, there's a man and he's lying in the desert with a backpack and everybody. And they would all get it and laugh at me that I couldn't because I was asking the wrong questions. Well, did, what color was the backpack? You're missing the whole point, Dad. 
But finally, they would explain it, and I would go, of course I understood that. Of course, it makes sense now. Two layers to peel back as you begin looking into this parable and others. Layer one, do you have ears to hear? Secondly, do you have a will to apply and obey the meaning of the parable? Jesus points to this, we'll come back to this next week, to the mystery, the uh, mysterion about the kingdom of God. He's talking about the kingdom of God. That was the signature of these false teachers, these religious leaders who believed that their Judaism, their brand of following the law was the defining walls of the kingdom of God. They were the leaders. Everyone else is an outsider. And the crucial thing to notice is that this story is about insiders and outsiders. Jesus said that the insiders were not merely the Jews As the promised people, insiders and outsiders were about the kingdom of God, which was marked by faith and belief. That's what he's going to teach in all these parables. Faith and belief mark you as an insider or an outsider, as a believer or as an unbeliever. Jesus, God as king in human flesh, redefines the kingdom of God in fundamental ways to them. It's a reference to the realm of salvation not the prerogative of being Jewish. That was a radical idea to them. Remember we were studying Romans 3 and 4 and Romans 11? The idea that God's kingdom would be defined by belief in his Messiah rather than the birthright of being Jewish was a fresh new, what he says here, mystery that they hadn't considered. I love Colossians 1 verse 13. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us, listen, to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. That's the mystery of the kingdom. We can be transferred by God through faith in his son into his kingdom. Why doesn't everyone believe? Why doesn't everyone have ears to hear? Why wouldn't everyone have eyes want to see? You know, if if you walk as a believer very long, you're, you're gonna ask that question. What kind of fool would say no to the forgiveness of sins? What kind of fool would say no to the gift of God? What kind of fool would say no to the peace that can surpass all comprehension through any trial and any circumstance while we walk on this planet? Who would say no to that? Why do people disbelieve? Why do three of these four soils end up in hell? If I can sneak into next week. Second Corinthians chapter four, verses three and four give us the insight as to what's really going on in the heart of disbelief. The implications are profound and they are spiritual. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 3, and even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Even if people don't understand what we're saying with the offer of the gospel, it seems veiled. It's veiled to those who are rejecting it, who are perishing. And listen to this, verse 4. In whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. Just stop right there. Satan blinds the mind of the unbelieving. A fresh look at God and forgiveness in the gospel are to your right and Satan keeps blinders on and your face looking to the left. He's blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they may not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ Who is the image of God? Do you think you have enough spiritual power to defeat the blinding wiles of the devil, the blinding power of the devil in a person's mind? No. No. 
This passage, I've been studying this all summer in preparation for our time in Mark 4. This puts all of the prerogative on God and it puts us on our knees. Do you have an unbelieving friend? Have you begged God to open their eyes, open their ears to see and to hear, to give them understanding of what's available to them, of the trouble they're in before God? They may seem like they're rejecting you, but the devil has blinded their minds. You say, how can I crack through that? By God and his word and a clear explanation of the gospel, it is greater than the devil's power. Humanity is in an uphill trek to understand the gospel and without Christ's explanation and Christ's help, we have no hope of explaining what's inexplicable. We're used to it, but the idea, listen, you can be saved from your sin by the death of a Jewish Messiah who died on a Roman cross and rose from the dead after he was killed three days later. And because that happened, you can go to heaven. What? First Corinthians 1 says that's foolishness to an unbeliever. The ability to explain and graciously be patient and to talk through, this is what this means. It's super important for you to have as a tool in your evangelism. But, but, but... It's also, um, as we look through these three soils that will be representative of three responses to the gospel that didn't take, that ended in disbelief, my deep fear from this passage is that some of those three soils could be represented in this room in our church. So we look at this parable and we say, I, I want to look in the mirror, but I also want it to equip me to understand when people disbelieve and when they do believe. Because even when they do believe, there are different responses, 30, 60, and 100 fold. This is a theological template, a paradigm for understanding response to the gospel and people's response to when we preach the gospel. And that's why Jesus says, this is the entry, entryway, the on-ramp parable. You can't understand the rest if you don't get this one. So next week, we come back with the disciples to say, okay, so what do these different soils mean? And Jesus is gonna take very detailed time to explicitly explain what these mean. You don't have to wait till next week if you just want to keep reading, by the way. It's not hard to understand. But the implications and the applications are profound for how we view ourselves and how we view our gospel presentations to the world. You know, if, I, I mentioned the truth of the gospel a moment ago that the Lord Jesus, being God in the flesh, lived a perfect life, died a death he didn't deserve for sinners who deserved that death. He died in their place. He rose from the grave. You know, have you received that? And you gotta be careful. I know it's easy to kind of mull around and say, well, he's, this is the way we end a lot of sermons. Do you really believe that? You don't have to walk an aisle or pray a prayer or sign a card. You can believe that right now in this moment where you're sitting. Remember the two questions? Can you understand? That's not the main question. Will you understand? God has given us such a sweet, savoring understanding of his grace by giving us, if you believe the gospel, giving us ears to hear and eyes to see. We, we understand the mysteries of the kingdom of God that is defined by salvation. Boy, be aware. In the coming four weeks, we're going to look at these
these responses under the microscope and in front of the mirror. So please make that a part of your priorities on Sundays.